In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. A couple of weeks ago on social media, there appeared a video and photos. There was an Italian priest on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea, waist deep in water, shirtless. Before him, an air mattress, an air raft with a cloth on it, and a chalice and some other small pieces of cloth on his side, an altar boy holding the raft. And surrounding him, young adolescents also in their bathing clothes. And in this way, he proceeded to say Mass, the Norvis Ordo Mass. The Norvis Ordo Church only gave him a little slap on the wrist and said that he should have asked before he did such a thing and that there is a certain decorum for these type of religious services. The Italian police, at least, are investigating the affair as an offense against a religious confession and perhaps this priest, Father Mattia Bernasconi, 36 years old, will be fined He, however, only gave a half-hearted apology, saying that it was very hot and we could not find a suitable place to say Mass for these young people. So we thought to have it in the sea. Perhaps, he said, I was prudent and naive. It was absolutely not my intention to trivialize the Eucharist. And he was shocked at so many negative and resentful comments that he got on social media. Even if it weren't his intention to trivialize the Eucharist, he certainly did so by his actions. Such a sacrilegious affair would be unthinkable before the coming of the new Mass. We've had seen the scandals of clown masses, balloon masses, even rock and roll masses. Now we have a beach mass. And Jesus wept. How he must weep on seeing not only the sacrilegious new mass, but sacrilege upon sacrilege. The church authorities apparently didn't make a very big deal out of this. And on the other hand, though... They make a big deal out of suppressing the age-old reverent Tridentine Mass so that it will no longer be said within the structures of the conciliar church. Cardinal Blaise Supich is suppressing the Institute of Christ the King in Chicago that says the Latin Mass, even if it is the 1962 Mass. And so is Cardinal Wilton and Gregory in Washington, D.C., casting out of the church the one true form of worship in the Roman rite that has been around for so long. (coughs) But at the same time, then, they welcome in those who live transgender and homosexual lifestyles, saying that they belong to the heart of the church, to use the exact words of the same Wilton Gregory. Rome has become the new Jerusalem, once the beautiful and faithful city, but now our Lord weeps again over it. In the time of Christ, the scribes and the Pharisees had perverted the doctrines of Moses, had added their own rules, and were driving many away by their harsh teachings. In a similar way, then, those who occupy now the structures within the so-called Catholic Church are doing the same thing, corrupting the doctrine of Christ, scaring out many from the church by their terrible scandals. There is, there has been a revolution in our time within the church. A revolution is the complete overthrow of the former order 
and the establishment of a new one, and such was the French Revolution of 1789, which overthrew the monarchy and persecuted the Catholic Church in France, executing the rightful and innocent king and queen, thousands of bishops, priests, and religious, and hundreds of thousands of innocent French citizens. The revolution was the work of Freemasonry, which had already been condemned half a century ago by the Catholic Church. But the Freemasons were not to stop there. There was a certain apostate priest named Canon Roca, who was already saying at the end of the 1800s, quote, the liturgy, ceremonial, ritual, and regulations of the Roman Church will shortly undergo a transformation at an ecumenical council. The papacy will fall. It will die under the hallowed knife which the fathers of the last council will forge. The papal Caesar is a victim crowned for sacrifice. And another prominent French Freemason wrote in 1908, the goal is no longer the destruction of the church, but rather to make use of it by infiltrating it. Formerly, the persecutors of the church, like in the olden days in the Roman times, they tried to squelch the church, to utterly destroy it and to kill its members. But now the persecution of the church is taking up a different form, infiltration. So this was the plan of the Masonic sect for generations. They were to lay snares for the clergy in the sacristies, seminaries, and monasteries, which would have them following a revolution dressed in papal tiara and cope, thinking that they were following the banner of the apostolic keys. We see how they use this, using obedience. We have to obey, we have to obey without ever questioning whether the one who supposedly was in authority was actually someone who, would tr who should have been truly in authority, who actually held true legitimate power. In the year 1936, orders were issued from the Communist Party in Moscow, communism being just a spin-off of Freemasonry, that suitable young men be secretly prepared to enter seminaries and monasteries and to be ordained as priest. Manning Johnson, a former official of the Communist Party in America, gave the following testimony in 1953 to the House on American Activities Committee. Quote, the communist leadership in the United States realized that the infiltration tactic in this country would have to adapt itself to American conditions. In its earliest stages, it was determined that with only false, small forces available to them, it would be necessary to concentrate communist agents in the seminaries. This would make it possible for a small communist minority to influence the ideology of future clergymen in the past conducive to communist purposes. The policy of infiltrating seminaries was successful even beyond our communist expectations, end quote. The famous Mrs. Bella Dodd, who was also, had been a member of the Communist Party, and when she converted in 1952, also revealed their plan. In the 1930s, she said, we put 1,100 men into the priesthood in order to destroy the church from within. Right now, they are in the highest places in the church. You will not recognize the Catholic Church in the future. End quote. How prophetic were her words. When we see the, another recent scandal of the Pope Francis, whom the world considers the Pope, in Canada with the indigenous peoples, he partook of a ceremony, a smudging ceremony where the Indian sage was blowing smoke to the four corners of the globe, invoking the sacred spirits and calling on grandmother earth. And Bergoglio, Jorge Bergoglio, known as Franz, Pope Francis, 
did not have a problem at all with that. No issue at all. He put his hand on his heart according to the instructions of the sage and became part of this very pagan ceremony. And then he apologized for the so-called sins of the church. He apologized for the genocide, and he used that word, of the indigenous peoples of Canada in the Catholic schools. A complete betrayal of the church. The church as the mystical body of Christ as the spouse of Christ has no sins. She is immaculate. Of course, there are individuals who have sins, but the church as a whole is holy in her doctrines and in her teachings, in her morals. And there was no genocide of the indigenous peoples in Canada by the Catholic schools. Yes, indeed, they tried to convert them, to bring them over to Christianity, to eradicate in them superstition and paganism. But that cannot be defined as genocide. And so we see in the conciliar, the Vatican II church, something that is completely different than the church we knew for 1900 years. And so they destroy the institution of the church, not as an institution, but rather the faith of the people. Destroy the faith through a pseudo-religion, something that resembles Catholicism, uses some similar words, has the same old churches, but is not the real thing. And this is what the communists wanted, and we see this happening right before our eyes, that there would be a guilt complex introduced into the church to label the church of the past oppressive, authoritarian, full of prejudices, arrogant in claiming to be the sole possessor of the truth and responsible for the divisions of religious bodies throughout the centuries. Though this would be necessary in order to shame the church leaders into an openness to the world, to have a more flexible and tolerant attitude towards all religions and philosophies. The communists would then exploit this openness in order to undermine the church. Are we not witnesses of these very things happening? We see them right before our eyes on TVs, on the internet, in the news. How our Lord must weep over this Jerusalem that has again rejected him and has betrayed him. What a slap it is in his face. The heresies of Vatican II, false ecumenism that teaches that all religions can be a means to heaven, a means of salvation. When Christ came down, became incarnate, suffered and died for our sins and proclaimed, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have begun this month of August with the feast of St. Peter in chains, a very significant and important feast for us living in the wake of Vatican II, and especially for us who are living in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, since the cathedral there is named St. Peter in chains. In a certain way, the papacy in our own days is in chains. In the so-called sede vacante, the seat being empty, or rather sede usurpato, the seat being usurped. It is not simply empty, no one sitting on it. We do have someone sitting on it, not a true pope, but a false pope, a blasphemer, a worker of sacrilege, a heretic, one who, unlike Peter, does not profess Christ boldly to the world as the one true Savior, does not tell all men to repent and be baptized to be saved, but partakes in pagan ceremonies, partakes in worship with Jews who have rejected Christ. 
And so St. Peter, in a certain sense, is again in chains. Sixty-four years we have been without a true successor successor of St. Peter, without that voice of truth from the hill, the Vatican proclaiming boldly before the world that Christ is its light, its only salvation. The church is persecuted again in a different way, and all of us faithful suffer from this, from the scandals that constantly come out of this conciliar church, from scandals within the so-called traditional movement, the separation or the infighting of so many groups. But what did the early Christians do when St. Peter was imprisoned by Herod? The Acts of the Apostles says that the church prayed unceasingly unto God for him. But prayer was made without ceasing by the church unto God for him, for St. Peter, who was locked in the dungeons of St. Herod. They did not have recourse to human means. They did not rally an army to storm the castle of Herod and free St. Peter, but they bombed heaven rather with prayers. It was beyond human means to overcome this evil, and so they turned to divine. It is also in our day, beyond our means, beyond my means, or Bishop Ramola's, or Bishop Sanborn's, or Bishop McGuire's, to fix the situation. Many have tried, many have called for the traditional groups to work together, to get together, to make it work, to fix it, to elect a pope. But I tell you, it will not happen. It is not in God's plan. The victory will be in God's hands alone. So we too then, in this dark hour, must pray unceasingly for the ending of this sede vacante, this sede usurpato, that Christ again will come and cleanse his church as he cleansed his temple in the gospel of today casting out the workers of evil, the money changers, the money mongers in his house. And believe you me, that is also happening big time in the conciliar church in the Vatican, where some of these bishops have excessive amounts of money and live in luxury, where money laundering is done in the Vatican City under the radar. These are the people who have made God's house of prayer into a den of thieves where young children are abused and the abusers protected or even worse, promoted, where a false religion is taught. Let us at the same time thank God that we are able to see the teeth and the claws of the wolves behind that sheep's clothing, that we have been given the light to be able to reject entirely this false church, this counterfeit Vatican II church. There are still others who are confused, who are struggling, who think they have to still be obedient to these usurpers who stand in the places where true cardinals and true popes once stood. But we have seen that we cannot obey those who do not have true authority, those revolutionaries who have ousted true priests and true bishops, who have betrayed Christ, who are not truly vicars of Christ, but false antipopes. Let us pray without ceasing. It is revealed in private revelation that In a dark time, St. Peter and St. Paul themselves will come down and designate the man who will be the true Pope. And this true Pope will work together with a great monarch to restore Christendom and to spread the gospel into all the nations of the earth. Let us pray, work, and sacrifice for this end. When you pray your daily rosary, make this your intention. When you attend Mass, make this your intention, that God will soon bring this crisis to an end, will soon bring another one, another Saint Peter, who 
No longer a coward will burst forth from the upper room and proclaim Christ bravely and boldly to the world, that he is our one true salvation, that all men must be baptized and believe and do penance to be saved so that we may live to see the prophecy fulfilled that all nations shall bow down and adore the Lord God. All nations shall lick the ground before him. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.